my big interest is the whole idea that milk as a as a, a nu- nutritious food is is fairly deficient in most of our trace elements, right? I mean, that's how we have iron deficiency, potentially copper deficiency, and kind of marginal on zinc. And depending on the source of selenium you use, it, there's not enough selenium. So I, I tell my students, I said, you know, how can we consider mammals this highly evolved species, but yet mom provides a nutrient deficient diet? Yeah. <laughs> And and they look at me and they're like, what? And and so that's where well, I got most perfect food, right? Right, right. Well, I, I say you know the dairy industry kind of tells a little white lie, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> but what's really fascinating is what we've been doing now is looking at that transfer between mom and the fetus. You know, again, we when we talk about transition cows, we talk about the the metabolic athlete that dairy cows are relative to the the energy and the protein and, and fat metabolism and all those things. Welcome to today's episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Gail Carpenter. I'm the State Dairy Extension Specialist from Iowa State University. And I'm joined today by Robert Van Son uh, from Penn State University. Uh, do you prefer Robert? I use that officially, but most most of my friends call me Bob. Can I call you Bob? That's can, perfectly fine. Can our can our listeners call you Bob? Sure, All sure. Right. <laughs> I I know your other uh, hosts uh, Barry and and um, and Mark would call me Bob. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, Barry was my PhD advisor, so I don't. Uh, I, I don't, understood that. Yeah. I don't. I don't think I'm at his level quite yet, or Mark's level quite yet. So I always have to check first. So, <laughs> Bob, it looks like uh, you were at Michigan State University. You started at Michigan State University for uh, your DVM and your master's degree. That's something we have in common. I did my undergrad at Michigan State. Are you from Michigan? No, I'm not. And and I did my undergrad at Michigan State too. So I so and I did a residency. So so officially I have like what one might term four degrees from Michigan State. Oh so, wow. So I'm I a only Spartan, have one. Spartan. <laughs> a Spartan Spartan. So where are you from originally then? Originally from New Jersey of all places. Oh. Uh, I'm one of those guys. Uh Similar to, I don't know if you know, Gordy Jones and Walt Guterbach and some some of the, you know, kind of what I consider um, big veterinary term dairy practitioner types uh, who came out of the uh, urban background and, uh, you know, got involved in agriculture. Our Yeast 40 is a natural biotechnology from ICC designed to boost the health and productivity of animals under challenging production systems. Our Yeast 40 performance is supported by an unique processing technology that results in a pure product containing high levels of beta-glucans, MOS, and yeast metabolites. These factors, combined, promote the ruminal and intestinal modulation, helping the animals to reach their full potential. My uh, my master's advisor was Marshall Stern, uh, and he oh, grew up in the yeah. Bronx. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do say um, I grew up, like I said, in northern New New York, basic or northern New Jersey, excuse me, just a few miles from New York. But uh, it seems in the background, in the the my on my mother's side of the family, uh, they were dairy producers. So okay. there's that. Ideal Farms in New Jersey, the Tannis family, uh-huh. that's that's a distant relative of mine. So, okay. so I, I blame that on, you know, for getting yeah. involved in agriculture. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to sidetrack before we even finish your bio then and ask you a question that, that we didn't talk about before we started recording. Um, we hear a lot in most animal science departments now about how we're getting all of these urban students that are coming in, students that don't have farm backgrounds. And what do you think when you hear people kind of... Um, I don't know. We we tend to clutch our pearls a little bit sometimes. I think about what are we going to do with these students who, who don't understand agriculture and are coming in and don't have any agriculture background. Do you do you kind of hear that and think, well, that's a problem we've been having for or not a problem, but that's something that animal science departments have been dealing with for forty plus years. Yeah. No. I I agree. Um, I remember in my early years um, at Michigan State, 
uh, not having that background, um, I didn't do very well in my first, uh, I think it was ANSI 111 animal industries course. Uh, but, you know, I think there's so many opportunities and I, I do this at Penn state cause I teach mostly undergraduate students that are interested in, you know, veterinary medicine, of course, but a lot of them do come from non agricultural backgrounds. And, and I certainly open their eyes to those possibilities and, and at least plant a few seeds that just because you're not from agriculture doesn't mean you can't do these things. And, and when I was first in practice, of course, you get that question from a lot of your dairy producers, you know, well, what dairy farm did you grow up on? And you say, well, no, I grew up in the city. Well, then, you know, but but then I say, well, you know, when I ask you to do something, you say, well, grandpa does it this way and you don't want to change. You know, I'm just bringing you a new perspective and sometimes, you know, that that opens some eyes. And, and, and so that's kind of the, the approach. I think, I think the animal science departments, I know at Penn state, they're, they're very open to offering lots of opportunities to uh, students who don't have that background and, and, and get the hands-on experience. Right. Well, if you look at, I mean, it's just a math game, right? Cause if you look at the number of farms, they're shrinking. But if you look at the number of jobs that are available in agriculture, they're growing. So we're going to have to fill those jobs from somewhere. And the number of kids who are going to be coming from farms is going to just continue to decline. So at a certain point, we just have to start adapting. Yeah, well, and, and, you know, one of my first extension programs that I developed at Penn State when I moved there was what's termed the CowSense program. And, And what that was targeting was recognizing the lack or the limited um, opportunities for uh, workers with farm background on farms. And so this was a, a, an extension program that was targeting, uh, you know, how to teach people sort of that cow sense, you know, recognizing when a cow is sick and things like that. So you've been handling some of these issues for a while then? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll get back on track here. Uh, so you did after, after Michigan state, you did, like you said, four degrees at Michigan state. Um, you're a Spartan Spartan. Not, not all consent consecutively okay. <laughs> though. <laughs> did you go into practice for a little while then in there? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, um, I practiced in, uh, the practice that Mark Thomas practiced. Huh. In. Yeah. It's up in Lowellville, New York, um, which is where I'm at right now. I'm sitting out on the, the, um, porch of my lake house up here uh, in northern New York. And um, yeah, I joined that practice as a a fresh veterinarian. Uh, And of course, I did something students should never do or people should never do. I said I was never going back to school again, right? (laughs) (laughs) And you you already know, you already know the end of the story there. So um, this was a. This is. I don't know how much Mark has uh, shared with you, but when I joined the practice, uh, there was eleven veterinarians in the practice, and it was mostly dairy practice, of course, uh, up here in Northern New York State. And you know, I had a great time, learned tremendous amount of. You know, I kind of really filled in that uh, missing agricultural background in in being up here, but. I really came to this epiphany and, and realization that, you know, if I'm really going to work for my dairy clients, that school taught me all the wrong things. And I tell students that all the time, you're going to pay 200 and some thousand dollars and they're going to basically teach you the wrong things. And of course I, I get the, you know, you're crazy, but if you think about it, just like medical school, they teach you how to fix the broken cow, as Gordy Jones would say, and how to fix the broken animals. But none of our clients want their animals to be broken. You know, I mean, a, a cow that's, that has a displaced abomasum, and yeah, we can surgically correct it maybe in 25 minutes or 40 minutes, depending on how good you are. But 
she's going to have, be at a higher risk to be called out of the farm, not make as much milk, uh, not maybe get bred back in time and so on and so forth. So really preventative medicine was in its very, very early stages when I graduated in 82 from vet school and being out in practice then really reinforced that. And, and so I made the decision to take a pay cut, much to the chagrin of my future wife, <laughs> and went back to school and did a residency in reproduction at Michigan State and then followed up on nutrition. And I felt that nutrition and reproduction were really um, the two most important factors on the farm for profitability and, and to, for me to really help my clientele. My whole intent, of course, was to go back to the practice because um, that's where my wife was from. Her dad was a veterinarian in the practice and uh, one of the original founders and, you know, kind of practice more preventative medicine. Well, you know, as, as life goes on, uh, as I was doing my residency, I had a little bit of an altercation with a horse that I was on the, the bad side of and uh, busted up a second knee after sports injuries on my other knee. And so my orthopedic surgeon basically said, you're probably not destined to be a large animal practitioner anymore. And so that, you know, I tell my students, you know, they're all at a, at a critical point in their lives of making, you know, life-changing decisions. I said, well, I just let a horse make mine. <laughs> and and I decided that um, – doing a PhD in, in nutrition. And that's where I went to Cornell and uh, worked with Charlie Stiffen. And, and of course I had just unbelievable um, colleagues at that time. I was there when Mike Van Amberg and I were uh, grad students together and I worked with Ron Butler, I, you know, I worked with Peter Van Soost and Dale Bauman and, and Alan Bell and, and a bunch of others. So, it, to me, was the single most important and, you know, kind of life-changing experience. And then I actually did, after uh, finishing up my PhD, I went back to Michigan and practiced in uh, Sheridan, Michigan, just north of Lansing, but found out that, you know, the practice life and after doing the research and, and some of the teaching wasn't it. So that's when I moved to Oregon State University and, and uh, was on faculty there at the vet school. And then finally made it back to the Northeast. Yep. And, you know, after about eight years and, and again, disappointing my kids because they just loved it out in Oregon, um, just family issues and things like that. We decided to move back East. And so that's when I came on the Penn State and, Really, it was a, a good move uh, because, you know, similar to a position that you're in, I, I basically do teaching and extension and I just love it. You know, that's, you know, I just, I do a little bit of research. I collaborate with, with people and I've had so many connections over the years. Uh, well, matter of fact, um, I was one of the instructors when uh, Mark took the, the dairy uh, production certificate program at Penn State. So, so there's a lot of connections. We can play, you know, what is it that uh, the Kevin Bacon uh, thing? We the know, six, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we should play the six degrees of Bob Benson, right? <laughs> yeah. No. So, so are you in the vet school or the animal science department? Well, okay. So, so that's an important uh, thing to to get out because my my Penn State colleagues will will chastise me. Penn State is not the veterinary school. That's right. I sorry. Right? It's the, it's the university. That. It's the University yep. of Pennsylvania. Penn State is the land grant. I university. apologize. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you know, Penn State and Michigan State argue back and forth who was the first land grant. That's why we have the land grant trophy for football and so on. You know, that argument seems like it should be pretty easy to solve. But also, I've been to K State, who says that they're the Kansas State says they're the first land grant. Iowa right. State says they're the first land grant. Michigan State was formed in 1855. So I think. Same, and now it's the same year that uh, Penn State was. All right. Well, so I guess it comes down to the month then, right? Right. Right. All right. 
Well, I still believe it was Michigan State, but that's I may be a little biased. <laughs> well, I, I'm probably biased that way too, but I shouldn't say that too loud. Yeah. <laughs> so here's kind of an off the wall question before we kind of dig into some of the stuff that you're working on. So you did, uh, you know, you did, said you did your residency in reproduction. You did a PhD in nutrition. You went to vet school. If you had to go back and do another degree, because it seems like you enjoy doing this, you kind of keep going back to school. If you had to go back and do another degree, what would you do it in? Oh, I'd probably uh, do something in business or, you know, MBA or something like that. You know, again, again, because, well, that was one of the reasons I, I really didn't like or I didn't fit in well with practice is it, I was really hard pressed to charge people. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I liked I liked extension in the days when, you know, you could just go out and do things and you didn't have to charge people and things like that. So Yeah, that's an unfortunate part of the job now is trying to get money. <laughs> All right. Well let's dive in, I guess, and and talk about uh some of the topics that you wanted to discuss today. So so you told us beforehand that you wanted to talk about transition cow nutrition and trace mineral nutrition. But then as we were chatting before we started recording, we could, you said we could talk about anything. So we'll see, we'll see what we end up talking about. But um, I guess I'll start off and ask you when I, every nutrition class I've ever taken, and this is maybe a, maybe a shame on me thing, but every nutrition class I've ever taken, the mineral section to me is just the one that's so hard for me to get into. Right. It's just, I just have a really hard time caring about new minerals. I know they're important, but I have a really hard time caring about them. So why should I care about them? And what do you tell, how do you teach your students to care about trace mineral nutrition? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and I, I think back to my Michigan state days, I took the minerals class with Dwayne Ulray. Uh, and so, um, you know, he, he's kind of an icon in mineral nutrition. And, and of course, one of my mentors at the veterinary school at Michigan State when I was doing my master's was Howard Stowe, who was another vitamins, mineral kind of person. And so I had it pretty instilled in me. And I think one of the things that got me excited about minerals was from my practice experience. And, and I think this is an important uh, context here. I was a veterinarian and practiced, and then I got this additional education. And so that allowed me to sort of explain a lot of the things that I saw in practice that I didn't quite understand. And of course, in the days that I was practicing in the early 80s, in this area, we were we were treating every milk fever cow. And so I dealt with a lot of down cows. And this is when we first started to recognize the role of magnesium in calcium homeostasis in the interaction with potassium and so on. And so it was the excitement that I got from better understanding the mineral homeostasis and, and that aspect. And so when I teach, I teach a pathology of nutritional disease course um, to my undergrads, I use a lot of the cases that I saw and, you know, tried to tie how I didn't know then, then figured out this. And, and that really seems to get them more excited, you know, using case studies and, and, and talking about these different things. The trace minerals, certainly, I get, I get a lot of comments from the students uh, taking my nutrition class because they have to take, you know, the basic, the traditional animal science nutrition, you know, which is the, you know, the, the usual approach to, you know, here's the requirements and this is, you know, that's the, the doldrums, you know, because most of these students are interested in like working with the animals. But I, of course, did my work on vitamin E and selenium when I did my master's work. So, so it was very involved. That was in the time where uh, we ha weren't allowed at the time to utilize, to supplement selenium in the diet. So I saw a lot of white muscle disease and, and you know, selenium deficiencies. And right now in Pennsylvania, I have a lot of problems with copper. 
uh, it, term, it seems we have a fair amount of contamination with uh, molybdenum and high sulfates in our waters from our mining legacy in the in the state and so i'm seeing copper deficiency in beef cattle in sheep and in goats and so on and and as an extension you know person again this is where i i kind of delve into a lot of different species um it's been really exciting and, and i use those cases to get the students involved in better understanding this. And then the last thing is my big interest is the whole idea that milk as a, as a, a nu nutritious food is, is fairly deficient in most of our trace elements, right? I mean, that's how we have iron deficiency, potentially copper deficiency, and kind of marginal on zinc. And depending on the source of selenium you use, it, there's not enough selenium. So I, I tell my students, I said, you know, how can we consider mammals this highly evolved species, but yet mom provides a nutrient deficient diet? Yeah. <laughs> And and they look at me and they're like, what? And and so that's where well, I got most perfect food, right? Right, right. Well, I, I say you know the dairy industry kind of tells a little white lie, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> but what's really fascinating is what we've been doing now is looking at that transfer between mom and the fetus. You know, again, we when we talk about transition cows, we talk about the the metabolic athlete that dairy cows are relative to the the energy and the protein and, and fat metabolism and all those things. But underlying all that and, and you know, things that you and Barry had done and, and what uh, Lance Baumgard and others are doing where we're talking about inflammation and immune response, that's driven a lot by the trace minerals. And, and so what we have found is mom is very efficient at transferring those, those minerals into the fetus. Now, we don't know all the mechanisms in place, but um, I've done a couple um, abattoir studies where we collected maternal liver and you know, fetal liver for pregnant tracts. You know, it's amazing how many pregnant cows go through the slaughter system here in the United States. And so what I was able to show is there's a tremendous transfer, even when mom doesn't have good nutritional status. So if mom is in a deficient mineral state, the efficiency as um, shown by the ratio of fetal liver to maternal liver concentrations, say of selenium or copper or iron, is quite high. So in other words, the, the fetus is much higher in concentration than what the dam is. But when the dam is really high, like, you know, we, we overfeed copper in our dairy cows. Um, there's been a study out of, I think, Iowa State and, and at Michigan State that's shown, you know, very, very high uh, liver copper concentrations, and I saw it too in my Pennsylvania study, but the fetus doesn't concentrate it. So the fetus somehow protects itself from being intoxicated. You know, I get a, I get a number of uh, inquiries from various diagnostic labs um, asking, you know, is this a selenium intoxication in the fetus that caused abortion and so on and so forth? And, and as far as I can see, there's no in none of the cases, there's any kind of histopathologic changes that would be indicative of this. But certainly, we've been developing a large database showing that many of the trace elements, when they're very deficient, could lead to abortion. No other reason for the abortion, like no dystocia, no congenital defects, no infectious agents. And then stillbirth, and this fits in, there's some work at Iowa State by Grant Duell a few years ago showed that vitamin A deficiency is associated with stillborn uh, beef calves. And I've shown that too. I, I collected um, stillborn calves, uh, both beef and dairy throughout Pennsylvania um, that didn't have any evidence of dystocia. 
and we did necropsies on these. We did all the microbiologic, and then we did uh, vitamin A, E, and then all the trace minerals. And most of those calves that, uh, especially beef calves that were stillborn, had very, very low vitamin A status. So that's that's kind of I, I I guess that's a really long answer to yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to what you asked me. Um, it's it's that kind of stuff that the clinical oriented that the application of minerals is what gets the students excited. Yeah, yeah. It's more than let's see the the copper requirement for beef cows is ten parts per million. You know, right? <laughs> Memorize that. Yeah. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean? What is 10 parts per million? Right. So talk to me more about this idea of um, maternal fetal transfer. How does that impact how we should be feeding pregnant cows? Is it, does that, you know, really come into play during that close-up period? Is it something we should be thinking about in the far off or even late lactation? How does, how does this transfer concept impact trace mineral nutrition strategies when we're feeding pregnant cows? Yeah, that's a good one. So uh, again, how I got involved in this and and thinking about this was in the days that I was in uh, my early days of practice, the traditional approach to to dry cows was put them out on the back forty and ignore right. them until they gave <laughs> until they gave birth. You know, yep. I mean, and and in that paper that I wrote in 1991 in vet clinics in North America. Um, I said dry cow nutrition, the key to cow performance. That you know, and I started out that paper. I said management by neglect, and and that's and that's essentially how I describe dry cow management at that time. And so, what typically happened was these dry cows would be taken off grain and just put out on you know the pasture or whatever, and you know, because they knew about the concerns with uh, maybe uh, milk fever and so on. And lo and behold, you know, we saw metabolic, you know, greater metritis, mastitis, the calves were not as healthy. You know, we had, we dealt with more problems with coccidia and, and things like that. And so that's what kind of got me into, you know, well, if milk doesn't provide this, where is it coming from? And, you know, there's the original work uh, that came out of Canada uh, back in the, the late 70s and early 80s was the first one that started to recognize that there was this transfer. When I first started looking at this, I saw what I would describe as a positive linear relationship between fetal age and fetal mineral concentration, liver concentration. And so I thought that there was a this gradual transfer. Unfortunately, what I was using was uh, abortion cases. But when I went to the to the abattoirs and took samples, basically fetal liver concentrations of almost all the trace elements, is flatline from about three months of age, of fetal age, on up to uh, final gestation. So mom must just, you know, transfer this uh, just as quickly as possible. Um, But, you know, some of the other nutrients like molybdium, uh, there's negative associations like you know that the fetus doesn't accumulate that unless mom really gets very high and and so there's there's got, obviously got to be some kind of uh, transporter control at the level of the placenta and so on that is dealing with this but the bottom line is it would be best to be feeding trace minerals throughout the uh, you know the the dry period not just in that last last bit. Yeah. Now, does the form of the trace mineral matter as well? Well, that's another good question. Um, I think as long as we're we're getting uh, enough, what we'll call available mineral, that should be okay. I've not seen um, any real great 
additional effects using organic mineral, but if we take the concept that organic minerals, certain of the organic minerals are more available, maybe we can package the mineral in a smaller package in the dry cow diet since the dry cow diet, especially as she gets closer to, to calving, is a limited volume, right? And we want to make sure we get the, the appropriate fiber and protein and energy and so on in that diet. We don't want to overdo the ash. What do you think most nutritionists get wrong about trace mineral nutrition? Um, overdoing it and, and not looking at the interactions. Um, to me, uh, you know, the, the experience that I'm having right now in uh, Pennsylvania with the high molybdenum in our soils and, and in our forages, I've talked to various groups, uh, veterinarian groups, nutrition groups, and so on, and, and asked them, you know, do you measure molybdenum? Oh, no, it's not a problem here. <laughs> and and then when you you of course it's you not I can never at, measure it <laughs> right well that's that's just the point you know and um, I think other issues is people because of cost are using NIR for minerals rather than doing wet chemistry and so they're probably not getting uh, the right numbers and and many of them don't get the trace minerals because they just assume I'm going to just put it in the the mineral pack. And that leads to the potential overfeeding, but also, you know, the, the potential interactions. And, and again, water is a, is a big player here. Um, you know, the high iron waters that we have and the high sulfates in our waters uh, are, are major players for interfering with some of our minerals. Now, I saw on your um, on your background that you actually do a little bit with small ruminants as well. And you said in extension, you kind of do everything, not just not just dairy cattle. But it looks like you were doing some work in small ruminants. Are there any what special considerations are there for small ruminants? It's it's interesting. Uh, my experience in dairy practice and and dealing with ketosis and fatty liver cows, you know, the the, the classic fat cow syndrome that Dave Morrow talked about or or wrote about, nineteen seventy six Journal of Dairy Science, you know, that was that was a big thing in my mind. And when I went to Oregon State, I got involved in working with llamas and alpacas because they like cats can have fatty liver disease, even if they're males or maintenance animals. You know, I mean, in, in ruminants, we only see fatty liver disease in females, you know, in that transition from late preg pregnancy into, into uh, early lactation. The camelids have a unique metabolism that, that makes them prone to this. And so I was very interested in maybe looking at them as a model for fatty liver in understanding the dairy cow. And I ended up getting caught up. We discovered um, vitamin D as the underlying reason for a rickets syndrome in the these animals. And now I... <laughs> Now I have research going on down in Peru and, and do a lot of do a lot of uh, camelid work and and you know that's also parlayed into my sheep and goat work. So uh, basically, just I how I my my wife describes you know I'm just one of those border collies that just needs a new new thing to <laughs> to, to deal with and. I, I think I blame it on Dr. Van Seust. When I yep. took Van Seust's course, he basically said, once you understand the rumen, you can apply that to any of the species. Yep. And and so um, you know, I've taken that and applied the rumen dynamics to the camelids and then to the sheep and goats. And and so I've been working on areas of pregnancy toxemia, which is basically transition nutrition. Only, only it's a little earlier than what we typically see in, in our dairy cows. In, in our small ruminants, um, the pregnancy ketosis is a big problem. Uh, and also hypocalcemia during pregnancy rather than in uh, early lactation. And so um, there's so little extension work that's done in that area. Um, Although I, you know, at the bovine practitioner conference this September, 
uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Garland Dalkey, uh, and I, we've, we've been doing a beef nutrition course at AABP for a number of years. And one of your uh, former sheep extension specialists, Dan Moracle, we're going to do a sheep nutrition program for um, practitioners. And so there's a lot of interest, uh, given what's happening in the dairy industry, with some of the dairy practitioners kind of expanding out into the small ruminant realm, because it's a very underserved, and, and especially here in Pennsylvania, it's such a growing industry, whereas our dairy industry is contracting, but we have so many ethnic markets that we can reach uh, for, you know, lamb production or, or for kid, you know, goat kid production, that it's a really, really growing area. And so, again, nutrition as preventative uh, medicine is really important. And so there's there's been quite a bit of uh, outreach. I've done uh, webinars for ISU uh, uh, with um, uh, Dr. Bentley and uh, and with Wisconsin, and uh, it's been fun. It's it, it 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 allows me to apply some of the fundamental things, and and even this will sound even crazier. I even served on the NRC committee for horses uh, back in two thousand for the two thousand and seven, and it was because I wrote the computer program for the nineteen eighty nine NRC for horses, and then I took the Michigan State the original Michigan State dairy ration formulator that Bob Patton uh, developed in in the eighties and converted it to a equine program. And so that's, but I was asked beyond not only for the computer side, but because of my background in, in fermentation and, and the, the, you know, the application of, of fermentation, because, you know, most equine nutritionists are more monogastric types. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, yep. So what's the weirdest species you've ever gotten to work with? Oh, um, I was... I consulted with the, the Seattle Zoo on an overly fat pregnant elephant. Oh. <laughs> uh, trying to get her through her pregnancy and, and what kind of um, uh, diet that she should be on for, for her gestation diet. Um, did she make it? Yeah, yeah, did yeah. The calf her, it? It, her and a calf did make it. Yeah, so that was that was good. Um, also did some consultation on Santa's reindeers. Oh. Yeah. When I was out in Oregon, there's a guy who, uh, raises reindeer and, um, uses, uh, basically he makes all his money during the winter time, you know, you having live reindeer with a sleigh at all kinds of, you know, malls and things like that. But is uh, if I remember the that he was having problems with calf losses and and so on and so again it was is sort of a, a late pregnancy nutrition issue. All right, so it all ties back there then. Yep, yeah, yep. it all comes back to transition. <laughs> yeah, you also you you know we haven't really talked much about you have that reproductive training as well. So how does trace mineral nutrition impact reproduction? Probably not as much as what a lot of people kind of give it credit for, um, you know, there on the reproductive side, I, I look mostly at, you know, the protein energy, body condition score, uh, those kind of uh, aspects. Um, but now with the interest in, um, in immunologic modulation of metritis and, and the impact that metritis might have on the reproductive performance, you know, that that's where maybe some of the trace minerals and their impact on immune function might, might come into play. So it's all related. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we won't run out of things to study for a long time yet. I no, guess. no. What's the next puzzle that you want to figure out? How to catch fish. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been up at uh, our lake house for the summer and uh, uh, haven't actually gone fishing yet. Oh, no. Uh, I, I had uh, far too many uh, commitments to some recent papers and, and uh, you know, editor uh, activities. So 
Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll rephrase the question. What's the next puzzle that you think other scientists should be focusing on? Well, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, this may be reiterating some of the original. My, my original PhD work with Charlie Sniffen, I, I hypothesized that uh, based on our, our current understanding, and this you got to remember this is back in the late 80s, that we were underestimating the protein requirements for pregnancy. And, and it was based on, you know, some work in sheep where um, if with some of the catheterized studies that they had done, that the use of amino acids for energy metabolism in the fetus is naturally quite high. I think Alan Bell established that to be about 30%, 33%. Um, and then if mom was compromised in some way, uh, nutritionally, uh, the fetus doesn't get starved out, but and and mom can't transfer because of the type of placentation. So this is part of the the reproduction background of mine. The type of placentation prevents uh, non-esterified fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, from crossing. And if glucose isn't getting across because it's a a uh, diffusion process, so it's dependent on mom's concentration. Uh, it turns out that amino acids are actively transported and consistently transported across the placenta to the fetus, and so fetal metabolism uh, cranks up the you know the the oxidation of uh, amino acids for energy, and so just recognizing the the intake challenges in that transition period and and some of the other data. You know, what I did for my research is basically doubled what would have been the uh, delivery of net protein to the fetus by feeding bypass protein. And, um, and then we followed those cows. We, we fed the bypass protein throughout the, uh, the dry period. And so my control group, had a little bit of bypass protein, and they were being fed approximately about an 11, 11.5% 11 crude protein diet. However, using the current modeling that we have, like the Cornell model and, and so on, um, we were delivering almost 1,100 grams of metabolizable protein. But in my treatment diet, I was delivering about 1,350 grams of metabolizable protein. And as other studies have shown, um, by feeding that extra protein, you don't see big changes in milk production or, or milk composition. And so that's why the interpretation was such that, well, you know, the, the extra protein isn't necessary, right? But what we did see in, in our small study, uh, and unfortunately, you know, I wish I had more animals in the study uh, now, but we did see some pretty remarkable effects on uh, disease status and on um, reproduction. And so um, what we found was, uh, and, and again, this is the late 80s, so most of my cows were really fat. I mean, my body, my body conditions, this is back when we thought body condition score 3.75 and 4 was okay, right? <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, I had a, a, a really high prevalence of ketosis and, you know, and we, we measured beta hydroxybutyrate in my control cows, but had no clinical ketosis, but did, I mean, we had some subclinical ketosis as, as goes the definitions today, but the the cows that were fed the the extra protein prepartum showed much more stable metabolism so to speak and then those cows went on to to have better reproductive performance i mean their days open was much shorter um, and so we when we first presented that data in the early 90s uh, a lot of 
people, Mike Vandehar um, at Michigan State and, and Jose Santos when he was at Cornell, or not at Cornell, at uh, California and others, you know, they did their studies and basically showed, no, you know, there's no response. But again, their, their end point was milk production or milk composition. And so pretty much the, the NRC and everything stayed the same old, same old, you know. I mean, you know, uh, I've had many conversations, long conversations uh, with uh, you know, some of the, the premier researchers in the area, Jim Drakeley and, and you know, Rick Rummer and, and so on. And they were intrigued by our work, but, you know, not substantiated, you know, by, by other studies. But it's intriguing to me now to see some of the formulations like what Tom Overton is doing and, and others by, and what I hear from practitioners like the Gordy Jones and uh, that, you know, feeding the, that extra protein, you know, and a higher protein in that dry cow diet seems to be, you know, workable and, and positive. And so I would love to see, the, the reproduction and the metabolic, you know, a larger studies looking at that a little more closely. And, and I'm excited about, you know, of course, the, the amino acid side of things, you know, I mean, I would love to see some more work looking at what are really the critical amino acids. When um, Charlie Sniffen and, um, and, um, oh, who was it? Um, Bill Chalupa kind of used my my diets that I had formulated uh, in their modeling system to come up when we were they were first starting to look at amino acids. You know, they 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 kind of came up with lysine, methionine, but also phenylalanine uh, was was one that was of uh, intriguing in terms of differences in the two diets, and and so. Um, I know we, we, we look a lot more on uh, methionine and lysine, but I, I think there's probably some opportunities to be looking at some of the other uh, critical amino acids in that transition period, in, you know, between pregnancy and to lactation. So a lot of work yet to do. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> It'll keep us, uh, keep us writing grants for a while, sounds like. Most certainly. And yeah. then, you know, tying this to the inflammatory process and everything mm-hmm. else. Yeah. It's time for our famous three. AB Vista helps dairy producers maximize their herd potential with feed intelligence and targeted ingredients to optimize rumen function and overall animal health. From young calves to lactating dairy cows, AB Vista is here to combine industry leading products and optimal feed strategies to increase your ROI. Well, we're a little over the 45 minute mark. So I'd like to move in and ask you our final three questions that we ask all of our guests. Um, And you said you've heard a few of our podcasts before, so you know kind of what to expect. Um, But the first question is, what is your favorite dairy related book or resource? Well, there would have to be two. I mean, my, my, and, and it's not necessarily dairy. I always go back and reread the Van Seuss book nutrition and ruminants. You know, I, I was fortunate enough when um, I took his class at Cornell and he was in the writing process of the second edition. He, he asked me to edit a couple of his chapters. And so, so um, I, I still think that's like one of the premier, um, you know, books in, in, in terms of just nutrition. I mean, obviously not dairy nutrition, but I've already, you know, indicated that I do more than just dairy, you know, yeah, beef, rumens. cattle, sheep, yeah. and goats, rumens, <laughs> rumens, rumens. Uh, but beyond that, then hordes dairy, then, you know, I mean, that's where, you know, I look at where, where the current trends and thinking and uh, really, I, I, I probably should have been doing a better job at writing more in there, but. Yeah, no, it's one of my favorites too. Both of those are some of my favorites. So what is your favorite non-dairy related book or resource? Is, is Mike Hutchins suggested or told Barry he's going to cheat on the answer, and I am too. I love and I collect 
um, historic agricultural books. Oh yeah, and I'm, and I'm collecting more and more of the the Morris and Feeds and Feedings book. I and have one love, of those back there. Yep. Yeah, and love to go back and look at you know some of these older books you know from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. Um, and, and how they characterize things and how things are still the same today in some ways and, and how they're different. But, um, you know, looking at some of the diet recommendations and, and thinking, you know, if I ran that through the CNCPS model, it probably would come out pretty darn good. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, they talked about feeding multiple kinds of things, you know, not just, you know, soy, corn and corn silage kind of thing. But yeah, I, you know, the, the old veterinary text and, and the feeds and feeding texts, I, I enjoy leafing through and collecting. I have one. I have a couple of cool ones back there on my shelf that when we're, when we're done recording, I'll pull them out and show them to you. I, yeah. I love old books. They're, they're really, I, I enjoy, it's really interesting to see kind of the old perspectives and how mm-hmm. it comes back to some of the stuff that we still talk about today, yeah. even in terms yeah. of like man, like human resources. Oh type, yeah, type yeah. things, yeah, yeah. And they didn't separate out, right? I've got like a like a farm management book that spends like a whole chapter talking about like what it means, basically what it means to be a good boss. But right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so very very holistic and looking at the the system as a whole. So that's pretty cool. So our last question um, that you'll that you'll know is what sets successful dairy produce or dairy professionals apart from those who aren't successful. I, I have to admit that I haven't met too many unsuccessful ones, and I don't know mm. if that's just the luck of the draw or, or who I've associated with, uh, you know, I mean, but to me, keeping an open mind, keeping, you know, mm-hmm. keeping your thumb on research, but also exploring other avenues. I, yeah. I had a colleague that, you know, might travel down some pathways that people think are a little crazy, you know, in terms of ideas and stuff. And he used to always bounce ideas off of me. And and I joy, enjoyed that, that challenge. You yeah. know, I mean, why does this happen? I mean, we can't always explain everything. And so I think uh, those that really do well are ones that they're, they're stand on solid ground of, of peer reviewed science, but also keep an open mind as to there are some other possibilities and, and consider yeah. uh, those instead of being um, too strict in, in how they uh, think about things. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I like that. That's a great note to end on. Is there anywhere that people can find you, find more resources about some of the stuff you've been working on? Not find you literally. I know you're at the lake house right now, but <laughs> uh, find more information about any of any of your work or any of the things that you're you're working yeah, on. Yeah, well, most most of my stuff will either be on the Penn State, you know, my directory page at Penn State or um, my LinkedIn account or something like that. Well, Bob, thank you for joining us today. It was really great talking to you. I had well, thank you. I enjoyed this conversation. Yeah.